Skywood. Two short stories written by Aaron Dembski Bowden. Read by Jonathan Cox. The Teller of Tales, written by Aaron Dembski Bowden, read by Jonathan Cox. Don't look up, she said to him. That's what they all said these days. The words walked the line between madness and sincerity, too new to be tradition, too insane to be law. And yet, you hear me? Her words were distorted by her helm's vocalizer grill, even as she snarled them into his ear. Don't look up. You get one warning. Just one warning, he said, looking back over his shoulder at her. Canna couldn't see her face. Her helmet stole any hope of that. He could see his reflection in the silver lenses over her eyes as her faceplate dipped in a nod. Then why, Kanna asked those cold eye lenses, did you just warn me twice? He gave her his best smile, which amounted to a dirty crescent of discoloured teeth. She responded to his question, or maybe to the grinning slit in his filthy face, by shoving him in the back, keeping him moving. The magnacles around his wrists clanked with the jangling tune of penal harmony. I could shoot you here, she pointed out. You think anyone would miss you? Kanna faked a gasp. (gasps) So much for imperial justice, eh? (laughs) She shoved him forward again. He stumbled this time, suddenly finding himself with a face full of wool, his cheeks squashed hard against the cold iron of the arched tunnel. That hurts, he said through mashed lips. Poor lad, the enforcer replied. He could hear the smile in her crackling voice. It sounded like a pretty nasty smile. You can't tell, but I'm crying for you, Canna. Really, I am. There were people nearby. Gangers, scummers, workers, nobodies. They watched and whispered and left him to his fate. Their useless chatter dissolved into a melange of wordlessness. Canna breathed in the smoky exhaust of a nearby track truck's fumes while the enforcer's squad vox clicked, spilling out the staccato crackle of other voices. His magnacles softly clanked their metallic melody, a treble overlaying the static-laden vocals. The truck's engine thrummed, a growling undercurrent bass to the jagged voices. All these sounds went right through him. He felt his hair began to prickle. His fingertips started to sting. None of that, witch, the enforcer grunted. I wasn't doing anything. You were murmuring, chanting. Was I? I don't... I said stop that, she snapped. The enforcer had a fistful of his hair and used it to draw his head back, slamming his face into the wall a second time. Harder now. Listen to me, deviant. If I see you losing control, this ends with a shotgun slug in the back of your head. He breathed slowly, ignoring the music of the mundane all around him, forcing his heart to slow down. What about my trial? He mumbled into the cold metal of the wall. Judge, jury, the enforcer replied, resting the muzzle of her shotgun at the nape of his neck. And executioner. The words had the weight of rote, tried and tested. Officer, he started to say, save it, witch. Remember, when we cross between habitation towers, don't look up. That's my third warning, Kanna said with a sick smile. 
You said I'd only get one. She stepped smartly back and drove the butt of her shotgun into the back of his skull. He felt the dull thud of it against the back of his head, and he felt it even more as his face rebounded from the wall. The pain was firebright and sickly sudden, and his smirking promises of dignity slipped away in that moment of animal instinct. He tried the truth instead, seeing as cocky resistance had earned him nothing but blood trickling from his mouth like hot slime. I'm just a storyteller, he promised the enforcer. I discern the Emperor's tarot. I read fortunes. I didn't do anything wrong. Her answer was to haul him to his feet. When did I fall over? And shove him along the walkway. The crowd dispersed as he shambled along at gunpoint. Several more enforcers joined the first. They manhandled him with the same gentleness. Ahead was the sky bridge between buildings, where they'd be briefly under the open sky. Wind warnings showed green on nearby pylons. Safe. 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 The commute gates were open. Foot traffic was in flow, though it was slowly breaking apart with the presence of the enforcer squad dragging their newest prisoner through the packs of commuters. No one wanted to be near Kanna for obvious reasons. What is it you think I did? he asked his captors at one point. I'm accredited, he added, tested and sanctioned. My abilities aren't dangerous. The first enforcer spoke her voice low and weary with disbelief. His protests were nothing she hadn't heard however many times before. If you didn't do anything wrong, why are you covered in the blood of the man you killed? Kanna looked down. He hadn't killed anyone. The blood on his clothes was... I... I didn't... uh, uh, I don't remember... The wind was nothing but a breeze, warmed by seasonal heat, and it tugged softly at his hair as he walked onto the sky bridge. Another squad of enforcers waited, keeping the foot traffic in line. I never killed anyone, he insisted, sounding more afraid than defiant this time. The enforcer sergeant said something but he didn't hear her reply. Not really. He heard her speak, but her words were nothing, devoid of meaning. They became a song of syllables, joining the bootsteps of those around him, joining the whisper of the wind against his clothes and through the railings of the sky bridge, joining the scuffing rhythm of the enforcer's flak armour, joining the drumbeat of his heart and the bass of his breathing, joining the song, the song, the song. And in that song, a voice beautiful and loving and beckoning. Look up, look up, look up. Kanna lifted his blood-stained face into the breeze. The enforcers shouted and drew weapons and did other things that melted flawlessly into the music. Things that Kanna couldn't follow. So lost was he in the silent song. Poison soaked the sky. He knew that. He knew the law not to risk letting your eyes fall upon the nameless energies that had drowned the heavens for over a decade. But the song was fading, and he knew, he knew he was dead the second he could no longer hear its harmony. He looked up. He stared at the polluted stars at the rift in space bringing migraine light to the whole world. At once, the song became a scream. What was left of Kanna's body came apart in a storm of enforcer gunfire. What was left of his soul became fuel for an unholy birth. 
What was left of the enforcers was found several minutes later, and by then, the creature that had ripped itself from the psyker's flesh and feasted upon its host's attackers was long gone. Just one incident, in one city, on one world in the Imperium Nihilus. That was The Teller of Tales, written by Aaron Dembski-Bowden, read by Jonathan Cox. The Godson, written by Aaron Dembski-Bowden, read by Jonathan Cox. They call him a god, a fraud, a demigod, and a liar. They call him a genius born of divinity, and they call him an abomination ripped from the pages of blighted history. Warlord, warrior, general, lord commander, dead man walking. No one calls him by his name in this tainted age. He has no equals, no betters, and stands beneath no higher authority. He is at once the ultimate symbol of hope for his father's imperium and the rancid avatar of everything the Empire has lost. Gilliman, Lord of Ultramar, thirteenth and last Primarch, Regent of Terror, stares at the tides of oblivion seething in the void. He gazes at nothing less than the blade that has severed the galaxy in twain. The Cicatrix Maledictum. The Great Rift. Its energies, fickle and foul, lash against the oculus viewscreen as the Emperor's last loyal son bears silent witness from the command deck on his warship. He'd given a speech at the outset of his crusade, an exhortation of fire and defiance, of rage and loyalty and pride. He hears it still the echoes of those bold words as he gazes into the wound in reality that heralds the death of half the Imperium. To the Space Marine chapters, bloodied and besieged in the Dark Imperium, we bring reinforcement. To the chapters lost in valiant duty or driven to destruction, we offer rebirth. To the enemies of my father's empire, we bring death. With these words, I, Robute Gilliman, son of the Emperor of Mankind, declare the Indomitus Crusade. Traitors, mutants, demons, pay heed to the coming of my armies and the ruin we promise your miserable kind. This galaxy is ours. Ah, how those words already taste like ash on his tongue. Everything was different, yes, that much was obvious. Millennia had passed since he truly lived, before this impure second life brought on by strange fate and alien sorcery. Of course everything had changed. But everything was still changing. And that was worse by far. Reports flood in of black ships heaving with flesh, unable to harvest the vast new tides of psychically awakened souls, of fleets falling silent, of worlds going dark. Cities, continents, planets overrun with shrieking entities clawing their way from the warp. Always worse closest to the Great Rift, but no world is immune no matter how far out. The luckiest worlds have seen a rise in psychic phenomena and catastrophic destabilizations of warp trade routes, enduring starvation riots, uprisings and rebellions. The unluckiest worlds are, by now, 
Nought but hellscapes, home to the lost and the damned. The Imperium is hemorrhaging. Soon it will die, as half of it has already died. No longer is it enough to fight and hold onto the Empire's crumbling remains. The only hope, razor-thin as it is, is to attack. Gilliman knows this better than anyone. One of his sons comes to him. Are they my sons? My nephews? Great-grandchildren? Whatever the truth, it's one of the descendants that yet claims a link to his lineage. How many generations of warriors have stood against the encroaching darkness during these ten thousand years of war and drawn strength from the gene seed of the thirteenth Primarch? Even for one such as he, the numbers are beyond reckoning. The warrior an officer in the Genesis chapter salutes with the sign of the Aquila, gauntlets banging against his breastplate. He informs his ancestral gene lord that all is in readiness. The fleet awaits its master's command. Gilliman will never admit this, but he sometimes struggles to immediately understand what his descendants are saying. Language shifts over time, evolving and devolving. What he once knew as Imperial Gothic has mutated over ten millennia and a million worlds, and the myriad tongues his officers speak in his presence sound precious little like the ancient root language. He nods in reply to the red-armoured warrior, turning back to stare at the smear of star-eating hatred splashed across reality a storm of infinite wrath. No description of the galaxy-spanning warp rift can be too pathetically poetic. The horrors of the human underworld wait within, at least when they're patient enough not to be vomited out of their own accord. The battle group waits at anchor not far from what various auspices and void scryers have promised is a relatively safe passage through the Great Rift. But what an intriguing word relatively is. Still, what choice is there? Gilliman raises a hand. Around him, across the bridge of the flagship, several hundred souls stand tense. The engines of his warship, several kilometers distant from where he stands, nevertheless send faint tremors through the deck. He cuts the air with his bare hand, giving the signal. Take us in. That was Skyward. Two short stories written by Aaron Dembski-Bowden, read by Jonathan Cox.